Welcome to School Britannia, the podcast where two Aussies teach Brits their own history. This is my friend Taya. And this is my friend Claire. And we're coming to you live from the south of France. Woohoo! <laughs> Ellie is back in Edinburgh working her ass off to promote some high quality festival content. So Taya has stepped in this week to fill in Ellie's history nerd shoes. Bonjour! Thank you for joining us. Much appreciated. Thank you. I'm Such- a bit nervous. You, you'll be fine. <laughs> you, I know you're an expert in what you're going to talk about, Good. which helps. And also, we're in the south of France with cheese and croissants, so literally nothing can go wrong. And heat. Yeah, way too much heat. <laughs> way too hot here. Big mistake. Should not have come. <laughs> so, because we're in France, I thought we would keep it vaguely French-themed. Mm-hmm. And we have some French-slash-British history to talk about. But you'll see. So, Taya, do you have a podcast recommendation for us? I mean, yeah, I. it's going to out me as an even bigger nerd than I already am. Um, <laughs> we but, love that here. We're um, all about being nerds. So, I've always been a, a Harry Potter fan. Yes. That's actually the book that I read first when I was learning English. Nice. Uh, that's the first book I read in English cover to cover with oh, no cool. help. Uh, so it's it's very dear to me for many reasons, but that's one of them. Um, and so there's this wonderful podcast that's called Harry Potter and the Sacred Text. I've never heard of this and I am a pretty big Harry Potter nerd. Huh. Well, I think you should give... It's pretty addictive, mind you, but I mean, in a good way. So it's a podcast with uh, Casper and Vanessa and they treat Harry Potter as a sacred text, which means they read each chapter with a topic or an intention and they try to see how this topic or intention or sort of like thread goes through the whole chapter. And it's I think it's just a great podcast about... I don't know, friendship and love and being kind and accepting people for who they are and not being judgmental and trying to be open-minded and it helps me meditate and I think it's just a really, really nice thing to listen oh, to. Oh, excellent. I'll have to add it to my list. Yeah. And also it's about Harry Potter, so there you go. You can't go wrong. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so what will you be teaching us about today, Claire? Well, Taya, I'm going to teach you about... The Norman Invasion. <gasps> da, 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 da. What? Norman Invasion? What? Okay. Yeah. Do you, how, how much do you know about the Norman Invasion? Do you learn about it in French history? Not really. No offense, but we don't really care about what happened to <laughs> It was your big power move. <laughs> well, yes and no. We had a lot of history going on, okay? We're true, not like Australia. True. Oh, <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah. That hurts. <laughs> Sorry. No, reality, you know, reality hurts. <laughs> Well, the Norman invasion, it's, it's a big deal. Mm-hmm. So, the Norman conquest, mm-hmm. or the Norman invasion, kinda either or. Long history. Good. Lots of stuff happened. <laughs> we go back to the 5th of January, 1066. That's very specific. Yes. <laughs> this is when Edward the Confessor dies. He is the last Anglo-Saxon king of England. Mm-hmm. Edward had been the eldest son of King Athelred the Unready, uh, from his second marriage to Emma, the sister of Duke Richard II of Normandy. A lot of name dropping. I hope everybody's following. <laughs> yeah, you don't really need to follow so much. The important part is Richard of Normandy. Mm-hmm. Relation becomes important later. Cool. So Edward the Confessor came onto the throne amidst like another battle for succession that involved like lots of brothers and grandsons from first marriages and whatnot. But basically everyone killed each other and he was like the last guy left standing. Ah, oh, that sounds like a uh, blockbuster. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, a little bit. Um, so Edward had spent most of his life in Normandy. And even though no one was left to contest his claim to the throne, he was helped by the support of this really powerful Earl Godwine of Wessex. And he marries his daughter, Edith. Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. And this whole battling it out for the throne thing was really common at this point because the throne wasn't hereditary. I see. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Which I didn't know. I mean, I just assumed it went father to son. I guess it had to start at some point, this whole yeah. father to son thing. So. Exactly. Yeah. So basically, there was no rules written down anywhere about how succession worked. And basically, you sort of had to have some relation to the king, but you also needed the backing of the church and the nobles, and you needed the king to designate you his heir. Because it wasn't inherent. So mm-hmm. it's always, this is why it's like always complicated. <laughs> Did it say anything about women? No. Uh-huh. No one cared about us. <laughs> what a surprise. <laughs> yes. Why do I even ask? I should be used to by now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, come on, Taylor. 
Um, and this is how we ended up with William the Conqueror. Mm-hmm. So Edward, so called the Confessor, because he was to distinguish him from Edward the Martyr, mm. who was another English king. All right. And because he was canonized in 1161 and was the patron saint of England until 1348. And he's the only English king to have been canonized. I did not know that either. Yeah. See, that's how little we know about other yeah. things. <laughs> see, I knew about the Norman invasion and I've been to Hastings to see the Battle Abbey and where it all happened. But so many things that I learned about this that I was just like, whoa. Just swept under the details. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's just, it's a, there's a lot. It's just always way too much to learn. Um, so no one cared about any of this on that day, the 5th of January, 1066. All they cared about was that Edward had died childless and had not named a successor. <gasps> which historians disagree about. Some of them are like, he definitely named someone. And someone's like, no, he definitely named this other guy. Which basically means we have no idea. But the next day, the Witten, which was a council of powerful men who advised the king, got together and just chose one themselves. And they chose Harold Godwine, the new Earl of Wessex, and the late king's brother-in-law. Uh-huh. Not royal by blood, but very high up in the government and brother of the newly widowed queen. So, like, good choice. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah. Unless he killed the king, so he could get that. <laughs> no, I think but... Edward definitely died, like, of natural circumstances. No one was suspicious about his death. Okay, I'll accept that. <laughs> um, but he had himself crowned real quick, because he probably knew trouble was brewing. Apparently in 1063, uh, William of Normandy had tricked Harold into swearing to support his claim to the English throne, which... Seems stupid, because why would you ever give up your claim to the throne? Yeah. But William is adamant that it happened. And, you know, the victors write history, so uh-huh. we have to go by what William says. See why you think the natural causes is fishy now? That's because that happened. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> true, true. <laughs> so, like, immediately people were unhappy with Harold being crowned. Um, obviously, Edward's family from the continent, more specifically William of Normandy, mm-hmm who was Edward's first cousin once removed. And he claimed that Edward had promised him the crown at some point. Uh And he was pissed off when he didn't get it. Which, like, again, it's just like, sure, but there was no evidence of that. And, like, you never came over to get involved in court in any way. You just lived... But who knows? It's so (laughs) long ago. Turns out, though, William of Normandy wasn't the only power-hungry one. There was another claim on the throne. So Harold Godwine's brother, Tostig, the ex-Earl of Northumbria, was in on the action. Uh Uh-huh. So Tostig was real jelly that his brother got all the power and wanted some for himself. Because he was like, well, you're no one but an earl, and I am no one but an earl slash ex-earl. Because there was the small detail (laughs) that Tostig had been exiled in 1065 because he failed to deal with a rebellion in his earldom. And Edward the Confessor had sent Harold in to deal with it and had ended up having to give in to the rebels' demands, which he was not happy about. Clearly. So he kicked Tostig out of England and gave his earldom to someone else. Uh Uh-huh. He was like, be gone. So when this whole question of, you know, the crown and the lack of designated heir came up, Tostig was like, what about me? Remember me? Yeah. (laughs) I'm coming back. Yeah. So Harold's crown and Tostig's like, hey. And he starts plotting. (laughs) And he forms an alliance with King Harald Hadrada of Norway. And he's like, you should invade England. It's a great idea. I'll get my earldom back. I'll be your right-hand man. I'll piss my brother off. Um, But in September 1066, Harald Hadrada sails to England with a fleet of 300 longships, which would have been around 11,000 men. And he lands in Northumbria. And Tostig had amassed his own fighting force and is, like, there with him, ready to fight. And then on the 20th of September, they meet forces of the English earls Edwin and Morcar. These are great names. Is that very English? Yeah, interesting name. (laughs) Yeah, Anglo-Saxon names are... they're strange. There's some other great ones coming up. (laughs) So they meet the forces of these two earls in battle at Gate Fulford near York. And Morcar is the man that Edward the Confessor gave Tostig's earldom to when he exiled him. So the plot thickens. <laughs> yes. <laughs> you can imagine that Tostig was like, shit yeah, getting me some revenge. Which he did, because Harald Hadrada of Norway and Tostig won this battle and like killed all these Anglo Saxons. It was a very long and bloody battle, but they won. So the Vikings now control York, and Harold Godwine has to decide if he goes north to defeat other Harold <laughs> before he can strengthen his hold on Yorkshire, yes. or if he waits for this inevitable attack 
from his cousin Billy that he mm. knows is coming because the Normans have spent the whole summer like building all these boats and amassing supplies and are basically just sitting around waiting for the winds to change so that they can set sails. Like, it's not a secret that they're coming. Mm-hmm. But he decides to go after the Vikings, and he marches his army north at a grueling pace. So they travel from London to York, which is 300 kilometers in just four days. Wow, that's like, really fast. Right? It's like a whole damn army. Yeah. So Google Maps told me that that is 65 straight hours of walking. <gasps> which, if you're doing 12 hours a day, is five and a half days. Wow. And they're all carrying armor and supplies. So they didn't get any sleep. Pretty much. Yeah. Yeah, Like, insane. But it works because English Harold manages to surprise Viking Harold at Tadcaster on the 24th of September. And after another long and bloody battle, he captures the bridge at Stamford, which is, I don't know, like a key asset of York, I suppose. And they won as well after four days of street yeah, walking. Yeah, exactly. Like, wow. <laughs> yeah. Machines. And he totally defeats this Viking horde, and Harold Hadrada and Tostig are both killed, and the Vikings sail away in just 24 longships, because that's all of them that were left. Wow. Yeah. So, great victory for King Harold. Mm-hmm. Probably feeling pretty good about himself. I'm sure. Uh, but no rest for the wicked because the winds changed and William and his forces land at Pevensey in Kent on the 28th of September. <gasps> yeah. That's like four days later. They have yes. to do like, the exact same thing again. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so Harold had to turn his exhausted army around and march them back south to face this new threat. Wow. This time the march takes them two weeks. I see. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like- a bit tired on the way back. Yeah, maybe a few battle wounds or five. <laughs> so we all know what comes next. It's the Battle of Hastings, uh-huh. which I now wonder, have you even heard of, Taya? I mean, I do know the name, <laughs> and I do know, as you said, spoiler alert, that William won. Yes. Um, but I don't really know how, when, what, who. Yeah, I don't know the details. I definitely learned this at school. But like I said, I also went to um, Hastings when I was 15. With my parents, we went and did the whole like right. tour around the mm-hmm. battlefield. I think the reason we don't know is that all that matters to us is that we won, right? Yeah. We true. don't really need to know exactly how. Yeah, I wonder how much British kids learn about it in school. Um, so, Battle of Hastings. Uh-huh. Billy builds a fortification at Pevensey when he lands there, because why not? <laughs> and then he marches his army of about 7,000 men northeast up the coast to Hastings and like pillages the countryside along the way. Which seems to be mostly out of spite because he knew that was part of Harold's personal earldom. Uh huh. Um, so he's had two weeks in England to prepare and he's only had to march like 18 kilometers. That's pretty good. Yeah, he- so he's chill. He's good. <laughs> he's in a much better position than Harold, who was like on the defensive and whose army is like exhausted. Yeah. So when Harold arrives, Harold Godwine, the only Harold left in the game now. <laughs> He parks his army on Senlac Hill, and the two armies actually spend the night before the battle camping within sight of each other, which I'm like, isn't this the time for underhanded tactics where you sneak into the camp at night and just kill everyone? I mean, that's what every single film we've ever seen tells us. Right? So... Were they, like, what, just too tired, too gentlemanly? It just seems ridiculous. Why would you not? I don't know. Yeah. That's just me. I'm sure there's tactical reasons why that was a terrible idea. Remember, William wanted to write the history and look very good. True. So... True. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> So the sun dawns on the 14th of October and it's fighting time. <gasps> so the two armies had really different setups and battle tactics. So Harold's army all fought on foot. Right. So even like the nobles dismounted for battle. And the favoured weapon amongst professional warriors was the battle axe. <sighs> and the rest of the peasants and like the rabble at the back were armed with like spears and, you know, whatever sharp implement they could bring from the farm. Right. Good luck saving yourself. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> pretty much. Um, and the main feature of the English army was this shield wall that they created. Right. So they lined up on a ridge with like a forest at their backs and they just lined their shields up ah. and it created this like defensive wall. The whole army stands behind I see. and they're packed in like super tight. Like apparently if someone gets shot like with an arrow in this shield wall, they just, you don't fall down because you're packed in so tight next to ah. people. It's just like shield, shield, shield. I think the Romans used to do that as well i think it's a Roman yeah tactic. they made the like with the i'm yeah. making a lot of gestures a little, that don't make a little sense, turtle yeah. thing yes like at the you know at the top and then on the side yeah because yeah. if you can kind of connect all your shields together you make this great little defensive structure yeah. yeah the normans on the other hand fought in a newer style that was developing in europe at the time mm-hmm. which was a mix of archers using short bows 
foot soldiers and mounted knights, which were a new thing, mm-hmm. which I kind of just you kind of assume they've always been there, but they had to develop at some point. <laughs> um, and he had them arranged in the order of archers in the front, then the infantry, then the cavalry, which was about two to 3,000 men. So, like, his cavalry was, like, a large chunk of his fighting force. Yeah. But basically this meant that the Norman forces were much more mobile than the English, yeah. who had to stay still for, like, that defensive shield wall to be effective. William mm-hmm. also had God on his side. Of or course. Yeah. <laughs> like, at least the Pope, who had provided William with a battle standard to be carried at his side during the fight because he had the full support of Rome mm. for his claim to the throne. Mm-hmm. Which, it's a pretty powerful thing at the time. Yeah. So they start fighting at dawn. To win, the English need to stay tucked up behind that shield wall yep. while the Normans attack and destroy them when they get close and then, like, sweep forward in a line to defeat them. Mm-hmm. The Normans, to win, they had to climb the slope to be within bow shot of the English, which is, like, a couple hundred metres or so because short bows don't have the same mm-hmm. range. Then the um, archers and the infantry had to break the line so the cavalry could ride through and finish off the rest. <laughs> so they're like totally different strategies, which I guess, you know, that's sort of the point. Um, but there's this guy, William of Poitiers. Oh, the Williams. Poitois. How do I say this? How do you spell it? Uh, like this. <laughs> <clears throat> Poitiers. Ha! Nothing like what I said. <laughs> He's the chaplain of William the Conqueror, and he like chronicled the Norman conquest afterwards. And he wrote of the battle, quote, it was a strange kind of battle, one side attacking with all mobility, the other withstanding as though rooted to the soil. So it looks, it sounds like it would have been interesting to see. <laughs> uh, so the details of how it actually happened mm-hmm. vary depending on which account you read. I see. So here's one version of what maybe happened. <laughs> <laughs> but don't, don't quote us on this, right? <laughs> yeah. If you time travel back to the Battle of Hastings and it is different to this, do not blame me. So they fight for a bit. The English shield wall does its job, and, like, the big double axes the soldiers are swinging cut through any Normans who get too close. Apparently, you could, like, cut down a knight and his horse with, like, one swing. (gasps) They're really insane. The horses. I know, the poor ponies. Apparently, William went through three horses in that day, because, like, they just kept getting killed underneath him. It's like, that's so great. They're the real heroes in this story. (laughs) (laughs) Absolutely. Um, So the English are, like, holding the line, doing what they're told. But at some point, some Normans retreated from an attack on the English, and the English were like, hey, look at those idiots running away. Let's go after them. <laughs> but it is indeed the English who were idiots, because as soon as they broke from the shield wall, they were vulnerable, and the Normans turned around and surrounded them and slaughtered them. Ah. <laughs> Which, yeah, became a tactic they used repeatedly throughout the rest of the battle. They would charge, pretend to flee, to try and encourage the English to break ranks, and then they'd kill them when they did. I see. Yeah. And then at some point during the day, there's this rumor amongst the Normans that William is dead. And some of them start to, like, freak out and trying to run away. And apparently, but take this with a big old grain of history salt. Mm -hmm. He rides out into the front of the army, rips off his helmet so they can see his face, and shouts, Look at me! I live! And with God's help, I shall conquer! This is definitely a brave (laughs) horse. It just sounds like someone's writing a script at this point. So I don't really know if it's, like, the strategy or the archers or the huge cavalry, but eventually the Normans start to, like, look like they're winning. And then the English find out that Harold is dead. The most popular story is that he took an arrow to the eye, but there's another source that was written quite soon after the battle that describes, in detail, Mm. Harold being hacked to death by four Norman knights. Oh. Yeah, there's a lot of chat about gushing torrents of blood. Oh, It's super grim. So the arrow thing is probably the most persistent because it's on the Bayou Tapestry. But it's not even known if that soldier is Harold. It just says King Harold is dead and there's a bunch of soldiers underneath that huh. um, statement and one of them has an arrow in the eye. Right. They're all dressed the same, so you there's can't. no way to know that's Harold. Yeah, because they were all on food anyway. So yeah, exactly. There's no way to distinguish. Yes. Yeah. But the important thing is he's dead. Hmm. And so are his two other brothers, the Earls Girth and Leifwin. Yes, those those good names coming up again. <laughs> yeah. Um, and all of his house carls, which were his personal bodyguard, also dead. So some of the Saxon forces flee once they realize Harold is dead because they're peasants and they're just like, nah, not, not going to die for this shit. Mm-hmm. Um, and the rest stay and are slaughtered by the Normans, who are the victors after nine hours of battle. For context, most battles at the time lasted about an hour. What? Yeah. What? Yeah. But why do we have to watch films when battle is like five <laughs> hours straight? <laughs> yes, we should complain. Absolutely. Um, which just goes to show how well matched the two armies were and how big they were. Yeah. 
Um, but the Normans win in the end, and they clear the bodies from the centre of the battlefield, and they set up a tent for William to have a celebratory dinner. Fancy. Yeah. But this is not the end of the conquest. No, 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 Taylor. No, no, no. <laughs> so the aftermath is where this gets interesting, and it's when it gets its most conquesty. So the impact of Norman rule on England is huge. I cannot overstate that. It changed literally every aspect of the country. It's like the whole thing. <gasps> yeah, you did that. Your his- your history. <laughs> I mean, not you because you're Aussie, but really the Brits should be thinking us. We did yeah. them a favor. True. <laughs> Maybe. Depends how you look at it. Apparently people are still quite bitter about this, so I'd watch who you say that too. <laughs> that's why they always talk about the Battle of Hastings, because they're bitter about it, and that's why we don't talk about it, because there's <laughs> nothing to be bitter about. <laughs> True. So, Billy didn't have an easy time of it post-Hastings. The English were not impressed, and he had to take the rest of the country by force. So first he had to capture London, Mm -hmm. which he did, destroying more countryside in the process. Um, But he was finally crowned in Westminster Abbey on Christmas Day, 1066. Which, like, what a nice Christmas present to yourself. Yeah, and that's not that long. I mean, end of September, that's... Yeah, he didn't have to go far. I, I guess. <laughs> From, like, Hastings to London is, is not. It's not Remember I spent two weeks cruising down. True. Because he had all of this <laughs> leisure time. Yeah. Um, but he then set about subjugating the rest of the country mm-hmm. and massively changing the makeup and trajectory of England in the process. He completely changed the government, the church, the economy, social order, the lot. So power and wealth became more centralised, like, much more centralised. The lands of over 4,000 English lords passed to fewer than 200 Norman and French barons. <laughs> so the population of England was about 1.5 to 2 million people at the time, and only about 20,000 Normans came over. But they all took up really prominent positions in society, so their presence was very strongly felt. The English were removed from high government and ecclesiastical office. By 1073, only two English bishops were left in the whole of England. <sighs> the rest were all Normans. Billy also moved um, many of the diocese headquarters, like the main church or cathedral, to urban locations. So, like, the one in Litchfield moved to Chester and the one in Sherbourne moved to Salisbury, which are places I don't know where they are. (laughs) But if they mean anything to you, maybe that will help. (laughs) Does that mean he was centralizing things, right? So Yeah, because it gave him way more administrative and military control of the church because they were all in these central locations that he could get to much easier and where they had powerful Norman lords in charge. So And everyone was Norman now, all the people in power, and and they were all near each other. He isolated everybody that was... Provincial. Yeah. As well. Totally. Which ties up nicely to something I'm talking about oh, later. So, interesting. Yeah. Little mm-hmm. teaser. <laughs> um, he went on a castle building spree so everyone could see how powerful he was. Mm-hmm. He built the Tower of London. Oh, I didn't know that. Neither did I. I've been there. They like kept that quiet. Yeah. I mm. think. I must have, well, definitely twice at school. I think I've, yeah, I've seen it a couple of times. Never really yeah. realized. I went the same trip I went to Hastings I went to the Tower of London and never made the connection Um, but he did build castles all over the country specifically Mott and Bailey castles which are like a wooden or a stone keep on top of a raised earthwork called a Mott so basically like a man-made hill right um, with an open courtyard or Bailey surrounded by a defensive wall which to me is like a quintessential castle yeah um, that's the idea that you have yeah yeah See, and we we gave the world nice things, <laughs> like how to build a castle. <laughs> well, yeah, it changed the nature of warfare in England because it reduced the need for open field battles because mm. you could just hide away safely in your castle. There you go, yeah. Yeah. Mm. Um, so the Normans built over 65 major castles and another 500 lesser ones in the decades after Hastings. Wow. Which, yeah, they just went around just throwing up castles. They felt threatened. <laughs> Maybe? Yeah. Well, his power, like, he had to fight so hard to control the country that he wanted to make sure that once he got that power, he kept it and it was imposing. Mm -hmm. He didn't just build stuff, he destroyed stuff too. Mm -hmm. So within 50 years of his rule, every English cathedral, church, and most big abbeys had been razed to the ground and rebuilt in a new continental style. I did not know that. Yeah. And I've read Pillars of the Earth several times. (laughs) (laughs) That's it. Just like a hundred years after. Yeah, I think that's yeah. much later. This yeah. is like the second time we've mentioned Pillars of the Earth on this podcast. It's just because it's an amazing book. It's such a good book. <laughs> we love you, Ken. <laughs> um, 
So George Garnett of Oxford University points out that no English cathedral retains any masonry above ground which dates from before the conquest. Wow. How insane is that? It was it was like extermination yeah. of everything prior. Yeah. Exactly. You'll see. Not everything. Oh, <laughs> intrigue. Um, but this was great for the economy because all this infrastructure building was basically one big fat stimulus package. Yeah. Yeah. So that helped. And we actually know a lot about the impact of the Norman invasion on the English economy thanks to the Doomsday Book. Uh-huh. Have you heard of it? I have heard of it, but no, we did not study it in French. (laughs) I didn't think you would. We actually didn't really study it at school either. Like, it just kind of always got mentioned, and I was left going, what that? I feel like it's something mentioned in, like, the Da Vinci Code or, like, this kind of, like, (laughs) apocalyptic books or, like, something. Probably. Um, But it was basically a huge survey of the um, country's resources and wealth. Ah. Yeah. It was conducted between 1086 and 1087, and it was so named because its thoroughness suggested it could have been used for a final reckoning on the Day of Judgment. I see. Yeah. Um, And people were asked to give answers based on three time periods, 1066, 1086, and an intermediate period just after 1066, which reflected the state of affairs when the land was first granted to its current owner. I see. So it gives a really good view of what what the econ- was happening in the economy just like post invasion. Mm-hmm. So basically, the Doomsday Book shows that while the economy took a short term hit, what with William going around destroying everything to get into power, <laughs> um, it had fully recovered by 1086, and it only grew from there. Normans established trade links with the continent, and English wool became really popular. There were only 60 markets mentioned in the Doomsday Book, but by the end of the 1100s, there were 350 markets in wow. England. Wow. Which is like a huge jump. Yeah. William invited, or by some accounts demanded, Jewish moneylenders come and set up in England to create lines of credit between his two kingdoms mm. and throughout the continent. So Christians were hindered by usury laws, which prevented them from lending money. Yes. But there was no such rules in the Jewish faith. They became the predominant moneylenders in much of Europe. And they were the largest um, moneylending group in England by the 1200s. But England was violently anti-Semitic and they expelled the Jews in the 1300s. But there was this like time period because of the Normans where England had this large Jewish population, which it hadn't had previously. Um, The Normans also outlawed slavery, but they completely changed the feudal system in England creating a system of, like, fiefs and manors and knights and all that that we know of, mm. that, like, we think of as being quite, you know, Normal. quintessentially English. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, like, barons and all that were all created by um, – well, not created by, but the specific system that was being used, because there was already a feudal system, Yeah, was developed by Billy. They still had serfs, which I'm just like, we outlawed slavery. It's like, yes, but indentured labor, it's is brilliant. that really a good thing to replace it with? I don't think they knew the difference. Yeah. So labor became more specialized and more people became self-employed or worked for wages. The share of the population living in towns rose from 10% in 1086 to 15 to 20% by the end of the 1300s, which kind of tied into this whole centralization and urbanization of the population and Mm -hmm. power. Yeah. So most interestingly, in March 1067, William returned to Normandy, leaving Otto, Bishop of Bayou, um, to continue the process of building castles and subjugating the population. And he only returned to England on four other occasions. Huh. How insane. He didn't really like England, I guess. <laughs> no, but he was, because he was still the, like, Duke of Normandy. Yeah. So he still had duties down there. Shit yeah. to do over there. And, uh, yeah, I think he just did. He was like, well, I own it now, so whatever. <laughs> I don't want to do the hard work of, like, building shit. My name will be forever remembered. Yeah, and yeah. And that's enough. <laughs> Pretty much. So the effects of Norman rule can, like, still be felt today, even though it was, like, a thousand years ago. Yeah, we just have no idea that this is the effect of Norman rule. Exactly. I didn't know. (laughs) So the strong wealth divide between the north and south of England was very much set in place during the conquest. Mm -hmm. In 1066, the southern estates were, like, a bit wealthier than the north, which, like, makes sense because, like, the weather and the soil in the south is better. But then in 1069, the north rebelled. They were always the most resistant to Norman rule and because they kind of saw themselves more aligned with, like, the Scots and Scandinavia. Mm -hmm. And they wanted to try and get Edward the Confessor's, like, great nephew on the throne. Mm -hmm. Uh, Billy absolutely decimated them in what was called the harrying of the North. He not only used military might to, like, defeat them, he set about starving out the rest of the population. He was just like, fuck you. Just cruel. Yeah, apparently he was a really cruel ruler. Mm -hmm. Like, he was an awful person. Probably better when he wasn't around, I guess. Yeah, true. (laughs) Yeah. 
Um, so this meant that by 1086, the Southern Estates were four times wealthier, thank you, Doomsday Book, uh-huh. than the Northern Estates. The total wealth of Yorkshire fell by 69% between 1066 and 1086. Wow. And a third of manors were marked as waste in the Doomsday Book. In 1086, no part of the country north of present-day Birmingham had an income per household higher than the national average. So, like, no one was earning above average in the north. Um, In terms of average estate wealth, the richest county was seven times richer than the poorest in 1066, but 18 times richer in 1086. So, like, this wealth divide just grew into a chasm. Yeah. And it stayed that way until, like, now. Um, Even when industrialization brought factories to the north and made, like, coal there really valuable... A lot of that was owned by either rich Southerners or concentrated in the hands of the very few wealthy people Mm. that had been Normans in 1066. Mm -hmm. And so it just kept, like, this wealth divide just kept going on forever. It's a self-fulfilling prophecy. You're told that you're either poor or rich and therefore you're going to stay that way because that's what you're told. And when there's, like, three people who control everything, Mm -hmm. it's kind of hard to change it. And another one that I found really interesting was that Gregory Clark, an economist at the University of California, uh, found that students with Norman surnames from Doomsday are still overrepresented at the universities of Oxford and Cambridge. Mm -hmm. So it has a really direct impact on your economic well-being today to have Norman ancestry. Wow. Says a lot about how sedentary people became. Like, people used to move around all the time. But clearly this, from then on, there's been a lot of people were attached to their soil. Well, I mean, if you were were part of the ruling elite, why would you want to change that? So, yeah, that's the Norman invasion. Thank you, Claire. I have to say, and you got me on record saying this, that uh, we do not hear about this. And I'm pretty sure that's because everybody knows that we're very, very nasty. And that's why we... That's... that's that's cruel what you were saying. It's 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 yeah. It's very damaging what happens. And if there's anything I've learned about history, it is ninety percent cruel. Yeah, <laughs> we which I think is just very easy to think that the names we we'll remember are people who did really good things, and we don't really see at all like what really happened. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. It's just I don't know. I always think it's interesting because I learn about those things out of context, and then when you look at what an impact they had on like the immediate future of England, but also like up until now it's like whoa how did we not learn more about yeah. this and how how were we okay with this how do we say that it's you know it's it's fine it's yeah. not it's not fine yeah totally mm-hmm. but i feel like there's some other impacts of the norman invasion that i skipped over so uh what are you going to tell us about today Taylor? <laughs> well today i am going to tell you about um, we are going to be speaking um, about the consequences of the Normans coming to England. Yes. We're going to look at the uh, language aspect of everything. Yay! I'm so excited. Because we're language nerds. Yes. Um, so for some context, <laughs> Taya is a very proficient ESL teacher, uh, English second language teacher. She is French by birth. Yes, I'm also a French um, teacher, but then again, that's... Usually not the best thing to, <laughs> to be when you're French, to be a French I've teacher. I've always known you as an English teacher. It's because English is better. Mm. Um. <laughs> well, I did meet you in an English-speaking country, so there you go. <laughs> uh, but let's say that yeah, I've got both languages with me, so that's really helping with deciphering yes. the, whole, um, <laughs> the whole thing. Yes, so a lot of what I say uh, ties up to what Claire said. And surprisingly, well, filling the blanks... Quite well, I have to say. Um, it's almost like we coordinated I know. and chose this topic together. It's, I mean, and even <laughs> not even saying that, yes, of course, but seriously, there were some things I wasn't sure how to explain, and I kind of explained them now. So, Great. Um, it's helpful, because like, you need to know about the invasion to understand the consequences. I think. Um, so the only thing I need to do, and it's a little bit of backtracking, I'm sorry for everybody, is just that in order to understand the language bit of... The Normans, you yes. need to know a little bit more about the language bit of everything. Of course, yes. No, give us the history. Um, so I'll try and be brief with the previous everything, but I swear what I, what I say ties up well to, uh, to the, uh, the French bit. Um, so just to make sure everybody knows what language is, because <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure everybody knows, it's the way that people communicate. It's a good thing to define. I yes. think it's a good thing to define because yeah. people might wonder why do we have French and English and I don't know, Japanese and, yeah. you know, Aboriginal languages from Australia or from um, the USA. Like, we, why is that? Before all of these languages, there, were, there was really just one. 
uh, oh. kind of like the mother of all. What I say there, and that's what most historians um, think, it, it's pretty much supposition. There's not really that much proof of what... It's just yeah. what people assume from what we have available. Yes. Uh, so it's believed that there's one sort of mother of all language that's called... Well, at some point, the human population started out very small. Yeah, that's that's why we... That's why, not me, but people who study that seriously um, assume <laughs> that. Um, and so they call it Proto-Indo-European. Cool. Proto Chinese. as in sort of like ancient, sort of like the first one. And then Indo-European because it's believed to sort of be in that zone of, well, what we know as Europe now, but also the Asian uh, continent. So that's kind of the... It's very broad. It's very broad. Um, actually, if people are interested, they might be able to refer to a uh, an Indo-European family of languages. Yes, we'll absolutely <laughs> post a picture of this. There's a great um, little language family tree. Yeah, that I sort of dug out from uh, my uh, classes at uni. Nice. Um, <laughs> and that's what... I have no idea where it comes from. Uh, we can <laughs> thank, I guess, um, Professor Leo Caruthers from... The Sorbonne University uh, from giving, for giving you this, but I don't really know where else it's from. Uh, so anyway, you've got this sort of proto-Indo-European thing, as I said. And then the languages that we know now, they originate from there, but they're sort of separated beforehand. And that's why they end up being at some level similar, but also with their own, uh, their very own um, ways and manners of speech. And so what, y- what people usually call English is believed to be from the Germanic branch of languages. Yes. Okay. Whereas French is believed to be from the Italic branch of languages. I'm right. I think that's called Italic. So English shares a common ancestor of language with German. Yes. And French says a common ancestor of language with Italian. Pretty much. What um Italic is the name of that branch and then yeah. I guess what people would know that's the oldest from there is Latin. Oh okay, of yeah. course. Yes. And then from Latin you've got French, Portuguese, Italian, Spanish and But English. not English directly. But not English directly. That's kind of why some people don't agree with the family tree bit, because they think that it's a bit too easy, say to have the branches in this uh, in this manner because effectively what happens is that the languages outside of the branches still connect somehow yes, and still affect one another yeah so i i don't I don't remember exactly how how much people agree with the family language tree anymore but that's if you want to say something against it that's what you can say yeah uh, even though you have the families technically well then language is also but it's a good starting off point i guess it helps because what it shows if you agree with this is that technically english and french has not have nothing in common originally apart from the big say mother right. of all languages yeah so far back that it's not particularly that nobody even knows where it, where it came from um but yeah so it's there there was very little chance say that English and French would be similar. Right. And that sort of changed because of the events that followed. So when I was looking back into this, I thought, but tell me again, why would something Germanic end up in Britain? Because as far as I know, there's a C in between these two. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I think there used to be. Um, and so again, this is a lot of supposition, right? Yes. But what people think, what historians think is that there were four tribes of sort of German Dutch, this sort of area, and that they kind of emigrated to what we know as Britain around 450 AD. We don't really know why, because we don't really know if that's true. For um, the weather, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> and I think that, yeah, um, a lot of what I say is taken from this book that I love and that I recommend that people read. That's Mother Tongue by Bill Bryson. I'm a big fan of Bill Bill Bryson. Bryson. So if you like Bill Bryson, even if you don't, you should read that. Um, And I think Bill Bryson is really good at putting everything together. So there's different, you know, trends of history they take Mm. and sort of like makes it all very intelligible for people like us. Uh, so this is coming cool. from from there. What he says is that they, it was really an immigration, as in it was not an invasion or warfare. It was sort of really well thought of as we're just going there, but yeah. we're not trying to kill people oh, on the way. that's shock. I mean, that's why, you know, it's said, but also suppositions. So who even knows why yeah. people did that? And so those four tribes, these names might sound familiar to you. They're called the Engels. Oh, yeah. The Saxons. Oh, hello. The Frisians. Less so, but Less so. Um, they actually still exist, the Frisians. It's, yeah, I know. Uh, it's a breed of horse. <laughs> <laughs> it's also a, I suppose, a part of the now Dutch population. Oh, cool. 
and actually, um, it's, I mean, I've, I haven't witnessed it because I haven't been, but people say that if you go and listen to the nowadays Frisians, you'll feel like you're listening to English to an extent. Interesting. So, yeah, that's where I guess interesting. And the fourth tribe was um, the Jutes. Again, don't know about the Jutes. And so these guys kind of moved to Britain because they thought it was fancy, I guess. And then over, over time, they sort of settled and made seven small kingdoms. They were kind of, well, they were on the same, you know, piece of land, but they were still individual kingdoms. Mm. What's interesting at this point, and that some people may know already, is that this does not include Wales or Scotland or Cornwall. That all remains under Celtic rule, because the Celts were there yes. before. Yes. And those four tribes, the German Dutch tribes, did not go into what we know as Wales, Scotland and Cornwall. Yeah. These were still very much... Um, Celtic territories. What we do know, we don't know how, but we do know that eventually only the Saxons remained and the other tribes didn't. We don't really know how or why or what happened. We just know that England took its name from the Angles, even mm. though they are one of the tribes that disappeared. Oh. Um, and we do know that the Saxons somehow, well, they slaughtered the Celts, basically. That's how they managed yeah. to stay. <laughs> Um, Seems about right. At some point, though, the Saxons did get civilized in some way because St. Augustine Christianized them. Uh, and that was in uh, 500... Classic like, Christian I missionaries know. trying to bring civilization exactly right. to the wild hordes. <laughs> you got it, Claire. Oh, you know so all about patronizing. it. so patronizing. Yep. 597 cr- Christianized. Oh, interesting. Quite, yeah, just before 600. I, I, I don't think I knew what date that happened. That's I had no idea. Yeah. Um, and that was a good thing, even though we know that Christianization of the barbarian people is bad. At least it put them on the path for literacy and culture. Because before <laughs> that, they did not have any, yeah. like the language that they, the sort of proto language they spoke, we know very little about, but we know that it wasn't yeah. much. Um, and so that's only from then on that it became something something else. Because actually, that's from that, this date that historians sort of agree that Old English started. So yes. from 600 AD. Before then, we don't even call it English. English. We just call it a sort of dialect of Germanic of oh, some kind. Oh, okay. So yeah. that's when it becomes a distinct language in its own right called Thanks English. to Christianity. Right, so this Old English, uh, it's very different from what we know of present-day English. Clearly, because there's yes. a lot in between these two that happened. Oh, yeah. To give you a few examples, Old English had three genders, masculine, feminine, and neutral. Uh, Old English had also five cases with inflections. Another thing that Old English had that we don't have in present day English hmm. is that these words, these inflections, the way you change the ending, you had to do this according to the number, according to the tense, According to the person. So basically, depending on how many of you they are, if you're feminine or masculine or neutral Whoa. and so on, or what tense you're talking about, you have to change the ending of all of your words to make them match, to do the agreement Whoa. with them. So you end up with a much more complicated language. Um, so I have this quote from Bill Bryson that I find perfect to describe this. Even something as basic as the definite article the could be masculine, feminine, or neutral, and had five case forms as a singular and four as a plural. It is a wonder that anyone ever learned to speak it. <laughs> Speaking yeah, about Old geez. English. Um, and I think that's very well put. Yeah. Honestly, nobody would have been able to speak that. <laughs> so that makes Old English, when you look at it, very different from what we know of English today. So... That explains why you have something Germanic in Britain. Yes. Right? But we still haven't gone to uh, the the, (laughs) bottom of the story. Um, So before the Normans, we had other visitors coming in. And these were called, I don't know if you've heard of them, the Vikings? Um, I've maybe read a little bit about Vikings yeah. here and there. Just Just a small snatcher. Not much. Norsemen, they were called as well. (laughs) Um... Right, so these were kind of like the second threat to the territory of Britain yeah. after um, the uh, the German tribes. Now, in terms of language, Old Norse, as it's called um, then, is also a Germanic language. Oh, okay. So actually, it was pretty easy to communicate. Oh. Um, there wasn't a lot of, of... So it's like, hey, give me all your gold would have translated really well. Pretty much, especially if, you know, they slaughter your throat. Before, then they can just take the gold and not ask you. Then that's just that's just a lot easier, isn't it? Yeah. Um, An so effective communication <laughs> strategy. Um, I assume. Um, See, language barriers can always be overcome. I mean, the, honestly, the language of images is, <laughs> is a pretty good one, I'm sure. Um, 
even though that's that's true that these two were quite similar, Old English did adopt a lot of words from the Norsemen. Oh, cool. Um, so a few that you might know, leg. Leg. Comes from leg. Old Norse. Great. Yeah. And husband. Which I thought were two words Less we... important to me. Yeah, I mean, I don't know which one we need more, I guess. It's just, it's, if it's we have okay. to keep one, I'm choosing leg. Yeah, I'm choosing the two of them, actually. <laughs> <laughs> um, there's also a few grammatical words that we use in English every day that came from Old Norse. And in that case, uh, the, the three most common one I picked were they, them, and their. We wouldn't yeah. have that if it wasn't for the, for the Vikings. Oh, basically. no way. Yeah. Um, it's quite, if you're a, you know, language nerd, it's quite rare for grammatical words to be borrowed. Usually you borrow content words. Yeah. To say things. But here they sort like the syntax sort of, uh, got absorbed. And that's, that's quite interesting linguistically speaking because it doesn't really happen that yeah. often. So, you know, the Vikings, they killed, they maimed, but they also gave English words. Yay. Um, and gave back to the community. <laughs> in a way. <laughs> And that's where we get to our sort of final invasion, as Claire uh, mentioned before, 1066, the French. Da, 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 da. Now, should we say the French? Actually, we should say the Normans. Yes. And I couldn't be bothered talking about this, so I'm glad you were. No, that's fine. Because um, <laughs> I think it's, yeah, uh, yeah, I don't think you did mention it, so that's, that's good that uh, it's coming up. Actually, the Normans were not really French people. Nope. They were Vikings. Yep. Um, so did you find the same as me? They settled in the north of France in about 800, 850? Yeah, they like basically that. were this like Viking horde that had a fight with the French king. And he was like, oh, take this northern strip of land and leave me alone. Yeah. And it's where Normandy comes from because it's Norman, Norsemen, mm. Norman. There you go. Yeah. Now, these people really didn't like being Vikings, apparently, because... What we know of them, of their language proves that they've kept zero Norse. Like oh, they wow. have nothing that's left of old Norse in their language. So when they invaded England, what were they speaking? So they spoke a sort of French, right. but they didn't speak Parisian French. They spoke something that was very provincial. Now that's quite interesting <laughs> because of what you said before that they wanted to centralize everything and isolate everything that was provincial. Because, because that's what Paris was doing to them. Yeah, so it's sort of like trying to project whatever trauma they had on <laughs> others. <laughs> well, I guess, I guess they just saw that it worked as a strategy. I suppose it did. Um, but yeah, so we, that's why we make the distinction between French and Norman because they wasn't exactly the same French from Paris. Yeah. Uh, but it was, it was definitely fully French. It was just, I suppose, a dialect is what we'd call it. From the Parisian French came the Normans, and then the Normans went to Britain. Yes. And so this is what historians call Anglo-Norman. Right. So it's, I'm, I'm going to try and be thorough with the terminology, but if I say French, I mean Anglo-Norman. In total, it's believed that 10,000 Norman words were absorbed into English. That's a lot. And that's quite a lot. Yeah. Yes. Um, if I had that much money, then I would think it's a lot. So we're going to say that it's a lot if it's words. That's a metric. <laughs> you know, we go with what we have. Um, so as Claire explained before, the way the Normans uh, changed society is very visible in the language. So they created this sort of like two tier. Hmm. The, the Normans themselves, they were the aristocracy. And then whoever else was there, the, the peasants, they, they were below them. And what we see in the language is that if you're an aristocrat, you spoke French right. or Anglo-Norman. And if you were a peasant, you spoke English. Okay. So it may sound more cruel than it actually is because it was normal for the period that whoever was in charge didn't speak the same language as okay. whoever was the people. And so as a result, what happened really with this French influence, so this Anglo-Norman, is that the language that was changed was the one for high living. Okay. It was court, it was government, it was law, it was all these things. But everyday life, everyday things, there was still English. There was no real Norman, Anglo-Norman influence there. By this point, are the English speakers speaking Old English or Middle English? We're still down to Old English. Middle okay. English comes later. Right. So it's one of the many things that changed Old English into Middle English. Right. If you can, if you're following people, you could. <laughs> <laughs> um, right. So this thing about how you had high living and then sort of like everyday life. Yeah. It's quite visible in present day English, actually. So I've picked a few examples to compare. So if you think of a baker 
Would you put this into high living or into everyday life? Everyday life. It is everyday life. Uh, what about Taylor? Everyday life. <laughs> It's my everyday life. <laughs> it is your everyday life. Now, if we're in the, I don't know, like 1100s, still everyday life. <laughs> so that's, that's where, um, that's where you see the difference in the language in society. So something like a baker and a shoemaker, they were just basic trades and they, the names even now remained Germanic names. Okay. On the other hand, painter, peintre, hmm. and tailor, tailleur. They're very, very similar to our everyday French. And these were considered high living trades, high living professions. Yeah. Actually, people from Normandy were asked to come to England to become these people. Yeah, actually, mm -hmm. the English relied on the French for much of their fashion for yeah. basically the next 700 years. Yeah. And nobody in England would have been trusted with doing that. They had to get their own, like, <laughs> Norman people to do it. Yeah. Um, and another difference that I think, I mean, I was told in school about this, I don't know how, how much uh, people will know, is difference between the, the animal before it's eaten and the animal that you yes, eat. Yes, this one I did know. Yeah. So if you have a cow, that's a very Germanic word. Yes. Uh, but beef, boeuf in French, That clearly comes from there, yes. and that's because you're eating it, so it was high living. It was not what peasants would say, it was what people who actually could put food on the table, people yes. who could pay for it, would say. The peasants who raise the cow, but the rich people who eat the beef. Yeah, and so that's how you see that even though it's not an issue or abnormal to have this two-tier society, what happened with the language is that both words have to be kept because there there was such an influence from one way, but also such a, a desire to keep the words that you already knew yeah. that it kind of, well, why would one be better than the other? Let's just keep both um, in a way. And I thought that was... You know, we're talking 1100s, and that's still true today. Um, yeah. So that's, again, something that we see uh, has... Um, maintained its influence absolutely that's so interesting yeah i think that so this is going to be fun if you speak french definitely uh maybe less so if you don't but <laughs> i'll try and be very there are some um so there are words that are very transparent mm. between french and english that yeah. when you read them you can absolutely tell yeah that they are the same And I'm talking here about present day English and present day French. Um, but when you say them, they sound different. Right. So I'll give you an example. Question in English. Yes. In French, we say question. But it's sort of basically spelled. It's exactly the same spelling, but you say question, quoi, and then you say yeah. question, que. And that's because in, in Paris at the time, the French said que, but the Normans, they said quoi. Uh. And so because it was the Normans who came, not the French we from Paris, the you maintained the quoi. Yes. It's so it's still a French word, but we kept their dialect pronunciation. Yes. Interesting. Absolutely. And I had no, I mean, I always knew that this existed, but I know, I thought, oh, maybe it just happened over time, but there was a natural reason for this, uh, for this to have happened. And another one is, can you guess what the word, uh, chaudron could be? No. No, it's cauldron. Oh, of course. Yeah, now you say it, it seems obvious. And so that's because in Paris, you said ch yeah. chaudron, but in Normandy, you said uh, k cauldron. I just don't have a lot of call for using cauldron. I know, at the time, they did, though. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> And another one is that um, a forest in English, mm -hmm. in French, is a forêt. You don't oh, have the yeah. S. Instead, we have a little accent on the E. Oh, uh, cool. And that's because in in Paris, we took the accent, but the Normans had the S instead of the mm -hmm. accent. Um, so remember we said that about 10,000 Norman words came into English? Yes. And so it's believed that about three quarters of those are still used today. Whoa, that's so amazing. That's a pretty high number, yeah, I'd say. It's a um, huge retention rate <laughs> when you think about it. Um, now, the one thing that's tricky and that historians don't really agree on yeah. is that it's also possible in some capacity that French borrowed from English. Interesting. You would think there would be some. Yeah. Because I'm sure some Normans went back and took some words and... Yeah, so one example that Bryson gave was um, aggressive. Yes. We got the same, aggressive. But we don't really know who borrowed from who. Uh. I think it's easier to tell when you compare with Parisian French, because then you sort of know what's the root as opposed to the dialect. But mm. there are some words for which we don't really have that much history, so it could be either or. Cool. So it would be it would be wrong to say that it's 
all French that gave to English, there's a strong possibility that it happened the other way around. I mean, once you start trade links between countries, it kind of seems inevitable. I think so. And it depends who needs what word when for what. Mm. Um, so this is still very, like, you know, foggy, but this is basically, um, something that's, that's quite possible. We just don't know in, in what capacity it happened. Cool. And so remember when I said that old Norse had given some grammar? And some syntax to English with yes. they, them, and there didn't happen with French at all. Oh, um, with one exception, I will say. Do you know the um, the expression "attorney general"? Yes. Does it strike you as weird that you say "attorney general" and not "general attorney"? As in, do you I say? I never thought about that before. <laughs> yeah, that does seem weird. Say a red car, right? You don't yeah. say a car red. Yeah, I've never thought about it like that. Yeah. It's just such a ubiquitous word. I know, that, neither just... had I. And so that's because the order of adjectives in French is... So we don't say the red car, we say the car red. Yeah. Therefore, attorney general. Uh, and so that's why. So I guess when it comes to English and you see they had, you know... First it was Celt, then you had the Saxons, then you yeah. had the Vikings, then you had French. You're like... How did English, as it was then, survived? Because honestly, it could have just <laughs> disappeared no, away. again. Yeah. Especially because of what you said with how aggressive the Normans were. Yeah. Um, how did they just not eradicate the language completely? Yeah. Um, and so it's not really clear how it happened, but it happened. Because we're speaking it today. Yes. Um, one theory is that because it was the language of like the second tier, like the peasants. Yeah. It, nobody really cared. They, lived or died and so kind of didn't touch it yeah i think it's like like i said there was only twenty thousand normans that came over it like initially yeah and obviously you know they stayed and made roots and they but there was 1.5 to 2 million saxons in mm -hmm. the country like that's a huge population difference like even if yeah. the ruling class is speaking one language you've got a huge amount of other people speaking in another language to contend with. Yeah. Like, I think... And they didn't actively try to eradicate the language. Like, there wasn't an, a policy of preventing English being spoken. Yeah, I think it, was a, it wasn't seen as enough of a threat, actually. Yeah. Because if they had seen how much of a threat it could have been for them, then they would have tried harder yeah. to get rid of it and to just say, everybody speaks French now. Yeah, but the, it didn't matter because mm. they were in power. Yeah. They and didn't if anything, that. it only... It, it only helped them maintain that power because it, it like it highlighted the divide. And yeah, actually, yeah, and I think that's what that, that's what this theory is trying to say. That well, nobody cares. You're just peasants. Yeah, you're not um, important yeah. enough for us to even care what you're speak, what language you're speaking in. Pretty much, we're never going to talk to yeah. you anyway. <laughs> we're just going to get our beef from your cap. Yeah. <laughs> And so, remember I said earlier that Old English was really complicated. It had cases, it had genders, it had yeah. inflections, all of that. Somehow, kind of disappeared. Kind that of was probably smart. Yeah. I'm sure once we started, you know, opening up trade routes with the continent, we realized there were better options. Well, it just, just slowly simplified itself. And so, you know, Normans, 1066. A century later, 1150, there were no more genders, no more inflections, and the spelling was much simpler. Wow, that's really it was fast. Very fast, considering how much of a, the other language had an impact on. And I wouldn't say that, you know, it, French wasn't an inflected language. It has a lot of yeah. inflections, actually. So it I wasn't if that. It has something to do with the centralization of the population. Like that increased urbanization meant that people were spent, were much closer together and that you know, can definitely accelerate language development. I think, I think you're right. And I didn't look into this more, but, uh, that's probably what people who look into it seriously would say. And so you were asking earlier, and that's basically when we date Middle English, 1150. Oh, cool. There you go. Because we got rid of everything we didn't need. Yes. And in, in good news, um, this was the beginning of the end for our Anglo Normans and how, and these evil, evil people. Um, <laughs> Uh, I just want people to feel better about all the bad things they did and to know that in the end, they're still lost. Um, <laughs> <laughs> a great sentiment to take away. And that's also, I think it feeds into why English, as we know, survived. Um, so in um, 1204, the Normans actually lost Normandy. Aww. So that's a bit of an issue considering that this is that's where you get sad. your name. Um, and as a result, they began to feel more and more English. I'm guessing they lost it to the French. Yes, they lost it yeah. to the King of France. Then. Yeah. Now, French was still the official language of England until actually 1362. 
Oh, wow. But it was more of a think Latin for the church, sort of official language. Yeah, yeah. So it's the thing that we used to it's make what it fancy. It's did in courts, but, you know, yeah. out on the street didn't matter. Yeah. And you remember how, um, so the Normans were not really French because they were this provincial sort of, mm. you know, race of Vikings that Paris didn't want. Well, actually, what was really hard for them was that Paris mocked the Anglo-Norman dialect <laughs> a lot. And the aristocrats, rather than being mocked, would rather be really proud of English and just go fully for English okay. than just being a laughing stock because they were speaking half uh, yeah. half French, basically. And so that's that's how the Anglo-Norman bit sort of disappeared and English sort of survived because... That's they would... just our pure hatred of the French is what drove us back towards English. I know, English. And, it's, and, it's, and it's mockery. It's based on pride. It's yeah. like, I cannot stand being mocked. Therefore, I will speak a <laughs> totally different language of that. Wow. I mean, effectively, it doesn't mean that It anything... just seems like the most English thing you could do. <laughs> Now, when I say Anglo-Norman was dead, clearly the the impact it had was still there. And yeah. so a lot of the words that have to do with justice or the law, yeah. anything like that, would still actually be coming from French. But what happened is that the Anglo-Normans decided, we're really English now. Uh, and I read funnily that for the uh, Battle of... So we say Agincourt. I don't really know how you say that in English. Yeah, probably about that, but I'm um, not going to try since you just said it so beautifully. <laughs> <laughs> um that uh, Henry the Fifth, I want to say, rallied for. Anyway, he said, we have to fight for England because otherwise we'll have to speak French again. <laughs> Apparently, an excellent argument. was his argument. And we're, we're talking 1415. So that's wow. not like that far down the line, but it, yeah. it's how strong the fear of being French again <laughs> was kind of. <laughs> like, become. Um, so when you look at all of that, all of everything to with, well, justice itself, the word justice is a French word. Justice. Um, uh, of course, that's, so a lot of, uh, French, French gave a lot to English, but some studies have actually demonstrated that the hundred most common words in English are all Anglo-Saxon. Ah, oh, so there you go. A little bit of word dropping there. This is all Anglo-Saxon. Child, man, wife, brother, sister, live, house, love, drink, sleep, eat, as well as all of the little function words, to, for, but, and, at, in, and on. All of this is all Anglo-Saxon and not French. But not there. <laughs> but not there, because it's Norse. <laughs> <laughs> and when you think about it, with what I said, you can make very basic sentences, yeah. right? Um, and so that's, um, I suppose, a visible distinction still today in... The play, you know, the part that French played in English life. Yeah, it, it, it was a very it wasn't it was everyday high living. Thing. That's so cool. I know, but I did find um, that there was a study by um, um, a man named uh, Douglas Kibbe. I'm going to say, sorry, Mr. Kibbe, that's not how we say your name. Um, he said there were actually five periods of Middle English borrowing from French. Oh, okay. So post 1150, five periods of time. That's you know, English sort of came back to French back and forth. It makes sense. Forth like, again. there's just such strong historical connections between the two countries. Yeah. And I would say trade, even war. Yeah. Um, all of this would... And then, yeah. you know, whoever would marry whoever, and then that would happen They're as always well. always doing that. Yeah. So we can't really just date all of the influence to... The Normans. The Normans. But it was a big one. But it was the bigger one. Um, now, the this fact that you had different periods of, like, coming back actually thought might explain why you have some words in English that have a French root, but have nothing to do with anything political or, you know, um, the uh, law, the court or anything. Yeah, yeah. So I was thinking of um, voyage. Voyage. Oh, nice, nice. <laughs> that has nothing to do with that. And also uh, autumn, that we say in British English, but not in American English, but oh. we'll say fall. Autumn is also a French word. It has nothing to do with court, yet... From French. Yep. Cool. Oh. And a little bit of food for thought, I guess. Um, English is actually very good at taking care of words that since then we've discarded from French. Right. So, so we've thinking, kept some things that you got rid of. Yeah. So do you ever use the expression RSVP? Yes. Yeah, we would never use that. <laughs> um, we say something else now. The one that I think is funny is double entendre. Double entendre? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but we don't, again, we used to say that in French, but we don't anymore. 
uh, but it definitely comes from us. It's like yeah. something we used to say, but we don't. It's um, how funny. So in a way, you sort of like, I guess, because you borrow them later on, the borrowing language holds on to them a bit longer. Yeah. And Whereas they might be at the like on their last leg by exactly. the time yeah getting obsolete. Um, and I thought as a reversal of fortune, uh, it'd be nice to mention that obviously now that English is a global language, it's French that's the borrower. <laughs> so my favorite example... <laughs> the tables have turned. <laughs> Pretty much. So I'm going to say something in French and I'd like you to tell me if you think you know what it is in English. Oh, okay. ASAP. ASAP? Yes. <laughs> so, or ASAP, I don't know how you as say soon, it. Yeah, I, well, yeah, it depends. As soon as possible. Yeah. yeah. And so in, in everyday, say, office speech in French companies, it's now common to say ASAP. In this very French <laughs> accent, clearly. That's so cool. Uh, that was borrowed from English. Um, so we've kept our SAP, but we've given you ASAP. I know. Uh, and there are a bunch of other ones like this that we sort of tend to borrow, but also change. So if anybody's interested, I think looking into words, you know, twice now when you see them and thinking, ah, I wonder where that could come from. Yeah. That's, uh, I mean, it's a slippery slope. Don't do it because that's how you become <laughs> a language teacher. So just don't do that. Uh, <laughs> If you want to hear more history tidbits, you can find us wherever you listen to podcasts. Please rate, review, and subscribe so other history buffs can find us. And if you want to know what sources we used, please go to our SoundCloud page. Link is in the description. Today's homework is to learn some French. You might be surprised by how much you already know. Oui, oui, oui. <laughs>